everyone, it's Jack from CultNolly.com and guess what time of the week it is. It's my favourite time of the week. It's week 39 of Wrestlers of the Week. How far we've come and how far we've got left to go? A little bit. We've got a little way left to go. The league table is nowhere near a foregone conclusion yet, especially in the past few weeks with a few of the chasing pack really closing in on Will Ospreay at the tippity tippity top. Could that happen again this week? I guess we'll have to wait and see. Let's get into my Wrestlers of the week. Now usually I do honourable mentions around this sort of time but there's been so much to talk about it's really hard to narrow it down. I want to give a special shout out though to a man named Shun Skywalker which sounds like ludicrous and very Star Warsy, but he is actually a wrestler, quite a newcomer to Dragon Gate and he took part in a tag match and was actually very good. He's a masked dude, I don't know much about him at all but he was wrestling with kind of the flair you'd expect of a more experienced sort of wrestler. Yes apparently he is prone from a few reviews I've read especially on Voices of Wrestling he is prone to a botch here or there, but he really wrestled slickly, in my opinion, and it was a really good tag match. So that's my honourable mention of the week. Now let's get in to the top 10. Number 10 is somebody from the Mae Young Classic, and her name is Rachel Evers, otherwise known on the indies as Rachel Ellering. Now Evers actually went out in the first round against Hiroyu Matsumoto this week, and I was really sad because I thought Evers put in one of the best performances of the Mae Young Classic so far. Maybe the best performance of the tournament this year so far. She was excellent. She had loads of babyface fire. There was no real heel in this match. It was just two great wrestlers going at it. And I honestly thought that Evers was the more impressive of the two, which surprised me given like the experience and the sort of Japanese pedigree of Matsumoto. But Evers looked fantastic in this match and I was legitimately very sad when she didn't progress. I think last year in the Mae Young Classic, Evers wasn't going to get any further than the first round, but then her match got changed on the fly because her opponent, who I can't quite recall, was making a few mistakes here and there. And apparently WWE just went right put Evers over instead. And this year, it's kind of the inverse. I think that, yes, this year she's gone out in the first round, and I think she should have progressed to the latter stages, because she really was that impressive. Hopefully, this is a sign of things to come for Evers, and hopefully she has more opportunities with WWE in the future. I've just realized that that sounds a little bit patronizing, because Evers does appear a lot on the independent scene, and over in Japan as well, where she's very highly regarded. So maybe she doesn't even need more opportunities in WWE to excel. Maybe she's fine with her career as it is. I don't know, but either way, whatever she chooses to do, or whatever opportunities present themselves to her, I hope that Evers excels because she really did impress me this week. Number nine, Hideo Itami, with another reminder that often 205 Live can produce some of the best wrestling matches in WWE. Itami faced off in the main event this week against Mustafa Ali and put on an absolute show. It was a great match. It went over a quarter of an hour, I think. It was really exciting. It was fast paced. It was hard hitting. There was lots of nimble agility from both guys. It was everything you'd expect when you hear the matchup Itami versus Ali. Also, Itami gets a little boost, in my opinion, a little bit of a bonus because he had a Falcon Arrow from the top rope and I love a Falcon Arrow. I don't know if I've said this on camera before. I think I often probably pop loads when Seth Rollins does a Falcon Arrow, but I just love a Falcon Arrow from anybody, especially from the top rope. And Itami executed that move absolutely perfectly. It was a wonderful match. Ended in a draw though, so it hasn't really told us too much about what's going on in the sort of slightly under the championship kind of race in 205 Live, the number one contendership race, that's what I'm trying to say. Slightly under the championship race. This is a match for the slightly under the championship between one fall, one fall. But yes, excuse my mental breakdown there. I think that Itami was really good this week and I think he's fully deserving of a lovely two points. I just want to see him on the main roster. It's Kenta, it's Kenta, WWE. It's literally Kenta. Next up, well, it was kind of Dragon Gate's big show this week, the, the WrestleMania of Dragon Gate, I guess. And, and in the main event, this man featured. He is Naruki Doi. Doi faced in the main event for the title his long-term tag partner and the current champion, Masato Yoshino. And I watched this match and I read some reviews of it as well online and it was a bit of a mixed bag. A few people said, oh, it's really good. A few people said, this is underwhelming and a sign of Dragon Gate's steadying decline. I thought it was okay, I landed somewhere in the middle. I didn't think it was like a match of the year candidate or anything like that, but I didn't think it was disastrous. Then again, I don't really know the history of Dragon Gate and what this match meant in terms of storytelling, but what I did think was that both men put on a good story in the ring. Just watching this bout, not knowing much about either guy, I was more impressed with Doi a little bit just because he was wrestling with a more fiery intensity. He really wanted to go after that title, and I get that maybe Yoshino is the more conservative champion, but I just, Doi really caught my eye in this one. Another thing to point out, another little wrinkle to this storyline was that before the match, Doi had announced that he was going to debut a new finisher in the bout, and that finisher turned out to be 
his opponent's own submission hold. So that's quite funny. That's quite good trolling, isn't it, from Doi? What a cheeky rascal. It came back to bite him, though, because then his opponent put on a modified version of that finisher and picked up the eventual victory. So, fair play to Doi. Even though he didn't win the title, I think that he put on a great performance. And he's got a new fan in me. You know, that sounds... That sounds like a song from the Toy Story soundtrack. You got a new fan in me. We need Pachidi in here to do his impression. Number seven, Mustafa Ali. Now, I've already talked about his match with Hideo Itami when we talked about Hitami a few seconds ago, but I think that Ali was the more impressive of the two in this bout. He is just, honestly, one of the most consistent wrestlers in all of WWE. Maybe even one of the most consistent wrestlers in all of wrestling today. Ali really does have it all. He's incredible at high flying. He did a 450 on the apron, which is the sort of move that if Osprey did it, it would spark a discussion about safety and that sort of thing. But um, no, Ali was really good in this match. He really has a knack for getting the crowd behind him and we know what 205 Live fans are like. Often they sit on their hands, they're a bit like unenthusiastic to see 205 Live. And time and time again, Mustafa Ali and Cedric Alexander, I'd put them on a level playing field, are experts at gradually winning the crowd around over the course of a match. I wouldn't be surprised if Ali eventually goes on to take the Cruiserweight Championship. God knows he deserves a reign with that belt because he's done so much for the brand since its inception. Number six, now last week after Wrestlers of the Week, my Twitter feed blew up because I was inundated with messages saying, you forgot to give Becky Lynch points. And I did, I'll hold my hands up. There was so much that went on last week, I forgot that Becky Lynch had finally won not only all of our hearts, but the SmackDown Women's Championship from Charlotte Flair at the pay-per-view. So. I've kind of carried it over into this week. I hope that's all right. I, I think a lot of you would probably agree with that decision. Uh, I don't normally do this, but I think it's special circumstances because Becky really did deserve some points last week. And this week continued her excellent heel work on SmackDown. She beat up Charlotte Flair backstage during a photo shoot and stood above her with the belt and went, take the champ's picture. She's now like the sister of Conor McGregor. It's amazing. But then you might be asking, why didn't Becky Lynch get more points then if you were so impressed with her? Well. Wrestlers of the Week doesn't just sadly depend on how well the wrestlers do, it also depends on how they're presented and how they're booked, and I really don't agree with this portrayal of Becky Lynch as a heel. It's no new argument, we've all made it a hundred times over on the old internet machine. We've all said Charlotte Flair should be the heel, Becky Lynch should be the face, why haven't they executed a double turn yet? I don't know. I don't know. Part of me thinks that they're just waiting, they're just hopefully waiting until it festers a little bit more and eventually we're desperate for Becky to turn face and then she will. But the other half of me, the pessimistic side of me, says, no, that's not true at all. They're just stubborn. They want Charlotte Flair to be their golden girl, and they're going to stick with that no matter what. No matter who, whose momentum gets sacrificed in the way, whether that's Becky Lynch or not. But well done, Becky, for your points haul this week. I guess for a combination of last week's title win and this week's charisma and heelishness, even though I don't necessarily agree with said heelishness. Number five, a member of my favourite stable over in New Japan Pro Wrestling, LIJ, and his name is Bushi. Now, being perfectly honest, I think Bushi is actually my least favourite member of LIJ. I'm just going to do a quick ranking now, actually. Here are my members of LIJ, from my favourite to least favourite. Naito, Takahashi, Sonata, Evil, Bushi. Bushi's my least favourite. I feel really harsh doing that. I've just done that right there and just confined him to last place. But luckily, Bushi actually really impressed me this week, or last weekend, more accurately. He had a semi-final match in the tournament for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship, which has been, of course, vacated after Takahashi's sad injury. Uh, everyone thought maybe this is Bushi's time. Bushi was the least fancied man in the tournament. He was facing Kushida in the semi-final. The other bracket was Osprey and Skull. So Bushi's kind of the smallest guy of the four. He did lose to Kushida in this match, but he put in an excellent effort and provided one of the best matches of the week. Probably the second best match of the week. I'll get on to the best match of the week later on in this video. But yeah, Bushi really impressed me here. He's He, he does mist. Everyone loves a good misting, don't they? That sounds, ooh, that sounds very dirty, potentially. Don't go on Urban Dictionary with that, please. So a very strong week for Bushi despite his loss, but could his career be in a little bit of danger because Tetsuya Naito has been teasing a new member of LIJ for a little while now, and nobody has actually come out of the woodwork yet to announce themselves as the new member. If there is to be a new member, that means there'll be six members of Los Ingobernables de Japón, and I think that might be too many, and that might mean that someone has to get cut from the team. I'm not saying it's definitely going to be Bushi if that happens, but it could well be, because they've already got two junior heavyweights, Takashi, who's obviously recovering from his injury, and Bushi, who isn't as popular as Takashi, so I'm quite worried for Bushi, I think. I hope he's all right. I hope he's okay. Number four. Now, I've been talking recently about Stardom's uh, five-star GP, their equivalent of the G1 Climax, a big tournament involving all the strongest women in the promotion. And now I'm going to talk about the winner of that tournament because it's over. It finished last week or this week. Mayu 
Iwatani. First of all, Iwatani had to get past Momo Watanabe to reach the final, and she didn't actually. It went to a 15 minute time limit draw. A really good match, probably in my opinion, the best match of the entire tournament. It was really, really good. Then she faced Utami Hayashishita in the final. Utami Hayashi. I'm just going to call her Utami. Utami is kind of like the Ronda Rousey of stardom. She's very green, very young, very inexperienced, but she has that natural instinct for wrestling and she's an absolute killer in the ring. So it wasn't actually clear whether Iwatani was going to be able to beat her in the final, but she did eventually. The final wasn't the strongest match I've ever seen, to be perfectly honest with you. It certainly wasn't as good as the 15 minute time limit draw I've just talked about, but still, my, you look like an absolute boss. And I can't think of a more deserving winner of this year's five star GP. The reason for this is because since the two biggest stars in stardom, which are obviously Kairi Sane and Iwa Shirai, since they departed for WWE, Iwatani has become like the ace of the promotion. She is now the leader of this entire, you know, she's the leader of women's wrestling in Japan, basically. And despite that, and despite having to take on so much responsibility and fill the massive shoes of both Sane and Shirai, Iwatani has done so really, really well. And She's only 25 years old. So well done, Iwatani. Some nice points for you this week. Now we're moving on to a man who hasn't appeared on this list quite as much as I thought he would at the start of the year, but is still one of the best wrestlers in the world. Of course he is. It's my number three this week, Kushida. Now Kushida, if you look at the picture I've chosen there, Kushida had a bit of a hard time getting past Bushi in that semi-final that I just talked about. Look at his face. <laughs> He got bloody missed and he did. Way, you little wanker. Wow, I can't just call him a wanker. He's one of the most respected junior heavyweights in the world of wrestling, Jack. No, of course I don't think Kushida's a wanker. I think he's a very, very good pro wrestler. And won despite looking like he's been on a very rough night out. This match was really good. Kushida is probably my favorite to win the whole tournament because he goes on to face the winner of Osprey versus Skull, which takes place on New Japan's next USA show. Uh, and I think Kushida has it in him to beat either one of those guys. I think, I think Osprey is actually my least likely out of the three guys left in the tournament to actually win the whole thing, despite his stature as one of the best wrestlers in the world. I think Skrull's really over right now, especially after All In. I think he could potentially win. I think that Kushida could win to show, sort of show that New Japan are like, hang on, we're not just going to put all the belts on all these Westerners. We still have some respect for the guys who held the fort down over the past few years, and Kushida is the perfect example of that. But despite all these future ramifications, I still think it's important to recognize Kushida as both one of the most highly respected and at the same time still underrated wrestlers in the world because he is one of the best wrestlers in the world and yet a lot of people forget about him when they're talking about the top tier guys like Omega, Okada, Styles, those sort of guys. I think the Kushida firmly belongs on that same sort of playing field as those guys in terms of a discussion of the best around and yet he often gets overlooked and he's really, really good. Getting all upset. Number two, the, well, I was gonna say the former ace of New Japan, but maybe he's the ace once again because he's really been on a roll recently and his name is Hiroshi Tanahashi. Tanahashi took part in the main event match of the Destruction in Kobe event in New Japan Pro Wrestling, taking on his old foe, one of the best feuds in the history of wrestling, Kazuchika Okada. The match was for Tanahashi's briefcase for his title shot in the main event of Wrestle Kingdom on January the 4th. One of the biggest matches of any calendar year is that main event. and. Tanahashi, honestly, was in a bit of danger here. The briefcase holder, since the stipulation was introduced, has never lost the belt between winning it and between cashing it in at Wrestle Kingdom. But I thought if anyone was gonna break that spell, it was gonna be the Rainmaker, Kazuchika Okada. So this match had a lot of tension to it, whereas in other circumstances, it might not necessarily have done. The match was excellent. Go and watch it if you haven't already. Melter's given it five stars, which doesn't mean a lot in 2018. There are loads of five-star matches. It's not even Okada and Tanahashi's highest rated match this year because they got 5.5 stars a few months ago, but at the same time, it was still excellent and well worth a watch. The best moment of the match for me came when Tanahashi was about to be superplexed off the top rope by Okada, but instead, and bearing in mind I think he's about 40, he pushed Okada off the top rope and leapt in one motion into a high fly flow. It was incredible. Then I think he sprang back up and hit him with another high fly flow or two so it was a really really impressive performance from a guy who's not the youngest wrestler around and someone who many people are surprised to see probably go on to the main event of Wrestle Kingdom but I honestly as disappointed as I was not to not to see Okada Omega again because I'm just greedy for that feud I can't have any complaints because Tanahashi has been that good since the G1 and now it's time for my number one and my wrestler of the week and I had to check my spreadsheet several times over to make sure this was correct. And it is correct. He is a first time wrestler of the week, Kazuchika Okada. Yes, despite being one of the best wrestlers in the world today, 
Okada hasn't been wrestler of the week yet. Well, he has now, but I'm so surprised. He's right up there near the top of the table as well. He's just been picking up nine points here, eight points there, but until this week, had never scooped the full 10. So what are the reasons for Okada finally being wrestler of the week right now? Well, I think that Okada was obviously excellent in this match as he always, always is. But it wasn't just that, it was the aftermath too, where Okada was betrayed by Gato, who is now sided with Jay White. For a little bit of context, Gato has been Okada's manager and mentor for many, many years. And the fact that he's turned on him is absolutely shocking. Okada really sold this betrayal really well and really, honestly, did everything he could to make Jay White look like this big new killer on the scene, which is really exciting. It looks as though we're probably gonna get Okada versus White at Wrestle Kingdom, maybe with Gato getting involved somehow probably just staying on the outside, I guess, but still, that's a very exciting prospect. It does mean, however, that Okada probably isn't gonna be in the main event of Wrestle Kingdom for the first time in four years. He has main evented the last four Wrestle Kingdoms in a row. Uh, two against Tanahashi, one against Omega, and one uh, this year against Tetsuya Naito. So it's sad times for Okada because he is not gonna main event Wrestle Kingdom for the first time in four years. But he's got some consolation in the fact that he's my wrestler of the week, and I'm sure that will help him sleep soundly tonight in his bed. Yes, it will. He watches these, definitely. He definitely does. Osprey shows him them. Osprey shows him and goes, look, I'm top of the list. You're not even top of the list, Okada. Can't catch me. Oh no, that's gonna get me in trouble. And now it's time to take a look at the league table. Kazuchika Okada is of course the big winner this week. He has came within a few points of Zack Sabre Jr. up in second place. Uh, as we see there, Matt Riddle and Volta both didn't score any points this week, but they are both wrestling at the Big Progress Wembley Show this Sunday. A little bit further down, Hiroshi Tanahashi has leapfrogged several people up into 13th position, and I fancy him to scoop a few more points before the end of the year. And as we move a little bit further down, as we get to the bottom, we'll see that Mustafa Ali has finally joined the top 25 drawing level with both Minoru Suzuki and Tyler Tyler Bates. So that's it for week 39 of Wrestlers of the Week, a week I'm going to christen Japan Week because seven out of the ten stars on this week's Wrestlers of the Week were Japanese. I, I, I think that's probably the biggest ratio we've had of any week in Wrestlers of the Week for any nationality. So week 39 now forever and always will be known as Japan Week. If this series continues next year, I will be christening week 39 Japan Week too. So congratulations everybody. Um, I haven't got much more to say on that. I've been Jack from CultaHolic.com. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to Jack the Jobber. You can follow all of us at Cultaholic. Check out our Patreon too if you wish. Patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And never forget, of course, if you haven't already, to hit that subscribe button and to join us.